talking with uh, Lisa the other day, I asked her how, um, how long uh, Alex's stay in the program at Capernaum, and I believe that uh, they could stay until they're 21, and so, um, and Alex, I think it's 18, so, um, so um, when he graduates from that program, <coughs> where, you know, your prayers make a difference because we're hoping that, you know, there'll be other uh, uh, sources of community for Alex, um, and like they said, part of that uh, kind of community uh, comes from Cornerstone, and so, um, yeah, the, just walking alongside of families uh, with special needs and uh, families without special needs. We're just a family, <clears throat> and so we want to just con- continue to grow and learn what it looks like to uh, live into this idea that we are connected together. Um, <clears throat> when uh, I have the opportunity, uh, actually it's a real privilege that I get to go travel overseas, and um, over the last oh, decade or so, I've been able to go to various places, especially in Southeast Asia. And uh, I go there, and we, uh, I partner with another pastor, uh, Pastor Wayne from Lighthouse, and we're often teaching about marriage and family life and parenting, and then also pastoral-related uh, issues. When uh, we talk to the folks there, <clears throat> it's a very different audience, and they have very different backgrounds in many regards. And so it's interesting because as we're talking about things like parenting, we have to tell them, yeah, it's not good to hit your children. And they go, oh, wow. Because many of them grew up in non-Christian homes. They became Christians uh, later on in life. And uh, so the way they were raised is very different. And so we tell them, yeah, you should, you know, talk to your children and affirm them and love them and things like that. And they're like, whoa, this, you know, huge, strange idea is coming into their minds now. I remember um, one of the uh, church leaders, uh, we told them, it's very important to spend time with your kids. And that was very important because... uh, what we found out was that he actually travels a lot in his ministry. In fact, he's only home one or two days out of the month, and he's just gone all the time. And so when we were speaking with him, and afterwards we had a chance to spend time with his wife and his two pre-teen children, it was really cool. We had dinner with them, and then we took a walk along the beach. And uh, the kids, you could see, they were just so happy to spend time with their dad. Their eyes, you know, their their face was glowing. They're just really thrilled to have this special time with dad because he's usually never around. And so going over there, we tell them, yeah, you know what? Your, Your ministry, your family is your first ministry. So important. Now when we come here, those same truths apply, but we don't have to emphasize that quite as much Because here, there's a different context. In fact, here is, we live in a society where children are not so much neglected, but they're idolized. Children are not just ignored. Actually, the whole life of a family revolves around children oftentimes. Their schedules, right? I remember um, speaking a few years ago, and people still remind me that I said these words, that I made a commitment not to be at all of my kids' activities. And people thought, huh, really? Yeah, because I wanted to make sure that my kids didn't drive my life, that our life wasn't going to be centered around our kids. That, you know, um, one of my uh, colleagues has said, children are a welcome addition to a family, but they shouldn't be the center of the family. And so when we had our kids, you know, um, yeah, we couldn't make all their stuff. And in fact, when uh, 
one of our children, um, you know, they all had activities. Don't get me wrong. They had activities. And when you have four, that, you're, you're pretty busy. But um, with, uh, with one of our kids, you know, she was very proficient in soccer. She, was, uh, she actually played uh, in college. She ended up playing in college. But when she was kind of growing up, she was in these select soccer leagues and things like that. And uh, we wanted to make sure our life wasn't just spinning around her schedule. So Rita volunteered to be the manager, the team manager. And so whenever there was a, uh, something scheduled on Sundays that would conflict, she actually rearranged the schedule so that we could be at service on Sunday because it was important. You know, between sports schedules or dance classes or language classes or kumon, I mean, there is never a shortage of activities that our kids can belong to, right? And so in our society, I'm not necessarily going to be advocating for parents, you need to spend more time with your kids, you need to, you know, although that's, that could be true, it's not a pressing need in our society. Now, if you were to kind of, if you had sort of a, you know, a, a camera on my life, you would go, wow, you know, I hear you saying one thing to a certain group of people, and I hear you saying something different to another group of people. You're contradicting yourself. And I would say, it's not a contradiction, it's an awareness of context and who the audience is and what the issues people are facing. Well, today we're going to be looking at a passage that some people have looked at and they've said, that sounds like it's in contradiction to other things that the Bible says. See, we're in the book of James. And the book of James is talking about how we could live out our lives that a life of faith should produce a changed life. Authentic faith leads to a a different type of life. And so this seems to, at times, come in conflict with some other passages of Scripture. In fact, uh, no less than the esteemed Martin Luther, who was the one who led the Reformation, uh, the Reformation away from the Catholic Church because he was, um, uh, he was part of the whole movement that took issue with some of the Catholic Church's teachings and practices. But when Martin Luther read James, he had a problem with James. In fact, Martin Luther, he called James's epistle, he says that it's the epistle of straw. There was this sense that this this epistle wasn't quite up to par with some of the other letters that are in the Bible. But we have to understand, Martin Luther, he had a problem with the book of James because in his context, he he couldn't wrap his mind around this book that says that, you know, faith without works is dead. Because he was living at a time when the Catholic Church was saying, you have to have not only faith, but you have to have works on top of that. So it was faith plus works. And he saw the abuses of the Catholic Church and what was happening at that time And so out of the Reformation came the great, you know, kind of rallying cries, Scripture alone, by grace alone, by faith alone. And so when he read James, he thought, wow, it's talking about faith that produces works. And so it rubbed him the wrong way because he saw the abuses of the Catholic Church. He took issue with these things because he was really keyed in on some of Paul's writings and what Paul had spoken of, especially 
in verses like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. This is what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says from the pen of uh, the Apostle Paul. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So I want us to keep this in mind as we go through our passage in James today. And we're going to start with James chapter 2, verse 14. And this is what it says. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So James is presenting a rhetorical question. Can a person be saved if their faith is devoid of good works? That is the question. And the answer James is looking for is a resounding no. He then offers a scenario to put the exclamation point on his argument. So he goes to verse 15. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Okay? So it's interesting. If you were to read this, um, uh, scholars look at this passage and they make note of the fact that it's actually, the way it got translated is sort of taming it down a little bit because as they translated this term poorly clothed, it's actually naked. That's the word. Like if someone came into your assembly naked and they're hungry and you don't do anything, it's sort of like, you know, you're there and someone, can you imagine that in your mind's eye? Someone comes to our assembly, they're naked and, you know, you kind of see them, you go, who's that? Harry, he doesn't have any clothes on. He looks kind of hungry. Hey, hey, Harry. Hey, God bless you. We're, we'll be praying for you, Harry. Hope you're doing okay. But you don't do anything for him. What, what James is saying is, you know, that platitude that you just gave, it does nothing for Harry. It doesn't put clothes on his body. It doesn't put food in his stomach. Those platitudes are worthless. Just as faith without works is useless. See, he's using hyperbole to paint a ridiculous picture for us so that we might see how ridiculous it is for us to conceive of someone who says he has faith, but there's no changed life. There's no works. There's nothing of substance of that faith. Verse 18 reveals the crux of James's understanding of the relationship between faith and works. He says this, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So our good works demonstrate that we have authentic, saving faith. This is how we could hold Paul's teaching in Ephesians and what James is saying here together. They're not in contradiction. When Paul says we are saved by grace through faith, it's not anything of our own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not by works. We're not saved by works. So that no one could boast, we hold that and we say, yes. And if you do have authentic faith, you will do good works. Verse 19 says this, you believe that God is one. You do well, even the demons believe and shudder. The truth is of that understanding, this passage, is uh, it's a propositional truth that God is one. It comes from Deuteronomy 6.4, and a Jewish person, he would be keyed in on that passage because 
it's one of the most recited and beloved verses in all the scripture for a Jewish person. Behold, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We believe in one God. There's only one God who's expressed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there is one God. He is unity. James' point is that the demons have perfect theology when it comes to the oneness of God. The demons believe, but their response is fear. Their response is that they shake at the understanding that God is one, but they don't have saving faith. And he's using this as a kind of an illustration or a point that he's saying, you could believe certain things, and you could be right on, check that box, but if you don't have a changed life, if there's no good works that come out of that, that's not saving faith. Perfect theology doesn't save you, okay? He then goes on, and he gives us a couple examples. And so in verse 20, he makes reference to the father of the Jewish faith, and that is Abraham. He says this, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified not by works or is justified by works and not by faith alone. You could tell just in that last passage, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, how that sounds like it's contradicting Paul. But like I said... Faith, authentic faith, will produce works, but you're not saved by those works. But James uses Abraham as a prime example of the relationship between faith and works. Now, when you go back to Genesis, what you find is that Abraham received a promise. He was 75 years old when he received the promise that he would become a father of many nations. He would, um, uh, out of his own body, he would have heirs that uh, uh, would come from him, and they would be too numerous to count. Now, for a man who's 75 and who hasn't had any children, that's quite a promise. And it was at that time, in Genesis 15, verse 6, it says this, And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham, 75 years old, receives a promise from God that he's going to have heirs, and he believes, and at that moment it says he believed God, and it was counted to him, it was reckoned to him, it was imputed to him as righteousness. So Abraham, in that moment, he's made righteous by God because of his faith. When I say he's made righteous by God, that means he's now in right standing with God. His sin is no longer taken into account, and he's been imputed the righteousness of God. He's 75 years old at the time. By the time Abraham offers Isaac up, it's decades later. Some believe that um, Isaac may have been about 20 years old at the time, somewhere around there, but if you do the math, that would mean it's 45 years later from the time he actually received the promise and believed it to when James references this account that um, he, he um, offered Isaac and it fulfilled, it fulfilled the promise and it fulfilled the fact that Abraham had saving faith. This clearly shows that Abraham was justified by faith and that faith was proved to be genuine 45 years later. Decades later, his faith was proved to be genuine. Now, don't make the mistake in thinking, wait a minute now, are you trying to say that Abraham, he had faith, but there was no work of that, that sort of substantiated that faith? 
until decades later? No, 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 no. James just cites one of the most famous accounts in Abraham's life that exemplified the authenticity of his faith. But he could have cited a number of other incidences in Abraham's life that would have showed that he had real faith. So don't think, oh, okay, if I profess faith, I don't have to show anything for years and years and years and years. No, that's not the point. The point is, is that authentic faith produces real life change, real works. Remember, James's primary concern is that people would mistakenly think that saving faith is just about acknowledging theological truth. But people who don't experience any real life change are not true Christians. Their faith is superficial, and it's considered what James says. He says it's dead. So I thought it'd be good to give sort of maybe a profile of what dead religion looks like. It's like, it's people who profess that Jesus is Lord in their mouth, but they actually don't follow him. That's dead faith. People who live and operate with the values of the world, that's dead faith. People who make their decisions and choices in life without regard to God and his will and his purposes, that's dead faith. People who may know Bible stories but have no relationship with the author of those stories, that's dead faith. People who claim to love God but hate people, that's dead faith. Paul's primary concern was that people would mistakenly think that they could do um, enough good works to merit salvation. James's concern is that people would sort of say, you know what, I know all this stuff. I know the stories. I don't have to do anything. Several weeks ago, I was um, at a reunion of, of uh, I used to be uh, a Boy Scout, and there was this reunion of all of us who were in the Boy Scouts. And I ran into somebody, and um, actually uh, the, 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 um, the troop that I was involved in was sponsored by the church that I belonged to as a kid. And I ran into somebody there, and um, uh, this was an elderly lady, actually. And I remember being, her being part of our church family at the time. And so it was really cool to see her. And I hadn't seen her in years and years. And, um, and she, uh, she, she said to me, oh, you know, because um, she's elderly, she said, hey, you know, uh, you know, when it's my time, I'd like you maybe to do my service. And I said, great. I'd love to tell people that you're in heaven with the Lord. And she said, yeah, that would be good. And I said, well, you, you know, have you trusted in Christ as your Savior? And she said, well, I've tried to be good. I said, no, no, it's not about your goodness. It's about God's goodness. And I kept on trying to point it back to, are you, do you, are you trusting Christ? And she kept on talking about how she tries to be good. And as I walked away from there, just sad in my heart, knowing that she was trusting in her own goodness. She was trusting that hopefully she had done enough to merit salvation. James is not talking about doing good works so that we might merit salvation. James is talking about having an authentic trust in Jesus Christ, and through that, our lives are totally transformed. James uh, concludes this thought with a second example and he uses Rahab this woman named Rahab and he says this in verse 25 and in the same way 
Was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Her story is that, you know, when the, um, the Jews were going to enter into the promised land, they sent a couple spies to look at the land. Um, Joshua sent two spies. I thought it was cool because, you know, we remember the story of how Moses sent 12 spies and 10 of them came back with a bad report and only two came back with a good report. And it's because of the lack of faith on the part of those 10, they, they sort of um, brought this bad report about how big the, the people were in the land and all that. And they discouraged the Israelites and the Israelites started complaining. And that's why they spent 40 years in the wilderness and now when they're going to go back into the land and really conquer it, Joshua doesn't send 12, he only sends two. What a wise man. And uh, these two men end up going into the land. And you can could, you could kind of imagine, right? They're spies. They get into the, the city of Jericho. And, um, you know, they, they, they somehow, they probably ask, hey, is there a prostitute who we could go see to let them into the city. And so they get in, but word spreads that, hey, there's some foreigners that came in. We think they might be Jews. And um, I think they're at Rahab's place. And so the authorities go to Rahab's house. But Rahab has heard the stories. Rahab has heard that the God of the Jews, he's the one that parted the Red Sea. And he's the one that helped them escape from and be delivered from Egypt. He's the one that has helped them defeat the kings of the Amorites on the other side of the Jordan River. They've heard the stories, and Rahab has heard what's gone on. And she's thinking to herself, wait a second. These guys, they're coming here, and they're going to take us land, and I have a choice to make. And her choice reflects faith because she decides to hide these spies. And so they're able to uh, e uh, elude captive, um, uh, being detected. And as we know, they go back to the, to the, uh, to the uh, Jewish camp. And from there, they, they lead the, um, the Jewish army into the city of Jericho. But I love the fact that James... When he's writing this, he thinks of two examples, Abraham and Rahab. And you couldn't get two different people, really, when you think about it. Abraham's a man, Rahab's a woman. Abraham is a Jew, Rahab's a Gentile. Abraham's an upstanding man, Rahab's a prostitute. Abraham offers his son as a sacrifice. Rahab offers complete strangers refuge and protection. She shared one thing in common. Faith. Faith that produced action. Faith that lived itself out in a good work. Rahab's checkered past did not disqualify her from exercising faith. And that faith was shown and proved to be genuine. And I love the fact that James, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he gives these two wonderful, very opposite examples of faith. And in so doing, I think he says to all of us, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter if you're an upstanding person or you have a checkered past. You too could have saving faith. You too can respond to Christ. To yield yourself to him and allow him to lead your life. And by do so doing, your life will be transformed. The very nature of faith brings glory to the one in whom we have our faith. Acts of faith bring glory to God. 
acts of faith reflect the fact that God is worthy of us being, uh, us believing in him and us responding to him. Over the last uh, few months, I've had the privilege of going to a senior living facility called Aegis Gardens, and it's where my father was um, staying uh, before he passed away. And so they have an assisted living area, and he, they also have a memory care area. And um, I've had the chance to go there uh, a few times now to lead a Bible study. And they've opened the doors for me to go there, and so I've gone there. And um, so when I go there, you know, there's a handful of these older ladies that join me for this Bible study. And it's really cute, and they're, you know, some of them are pretty sharp. They're, I'm not so sure they're tracking all the time, um, but um, on one of the occasions, I had the opportunity to go through a passage of scripture with them. It was on uh, the sower and the soils. Some call it the sower and the seeds. And so, as you know, the story that it says the sower went out to sow his seeds, and some of that seed fell on you know the hard ground, and the birds came and ate it away, and uh, some fell on rocky soil, and you know, it didn't have any root, and when hardship or persecution comes, it, it uh, withers away. Some fall, it says, amongst the thorns, and the thorns choked it out. And that's when, um, you know, the cares of the world, the worries of the world, or the pursuit of riches takes place. It sort of chokes that out. And then some fall on good soil. And so we started talking about this, and, you know, I started asking, so what does it look like to be good soil? And what does it look like to bear fruit? And, you know, they're saying, you know, we're trying to talk about, yeah, it might look like how you, how you care and you, you just show appreciation to the care staff, you know, those people who are there just caring for you. And then I said, yeah, and, you know, maybe bearing fruit looks like, you know, just being kind to some of the other residents there. And uh, one of the ladies in the Bible study, she, she sort of looks down and you could tell there's a spirit of conviction coming on her, and she says, yeah, well, I haven't been too kind to Toshi. You see, Toshi's this woman who, she's there, and she's, she's afraid. Every day, she doesn't know why she's there. And um, she, she has this look of terror in her eyes. And um, she's hard to be around. And Nancy hasn't been too kind to Toshi. But in that moment, there was a spirit of conviction that came upon her. And as I walked her back and walked the group of them back to the memory care unit, I saw Nancy go up to Toshi. And Nancy goes up to her and she gives her this big hug. And I just thought, wow. Wow. She's responding to the word of God. She's acting in faith. She is saying, I believe in Christ, and because of this, I'm going to respond. See, faith, authentic faith, results in changed life, changed behavior, the things we do. The question for us is, do we have authentic faith or not? How are we living in response to what God has done for us? See, if you find yourself thinking, I don't need to do anything. God saved me. I believe in Jesus. I don't have to do anything. And there's this sort of hardness of your heart that could indicate you actually don't have saving faith. You might have right theology, but you don't have saving faith. How will you respond and how will you, you live your life? Because faith does. Authentic faith does. It responds. There's a shift that takes place 
it's, it, it's a shift that says, it goes from, well, I have to do certain things to I get to do certain things. That's the heart attitude of someone who has authentic faith. It's not that, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that. It's, oh my gosh, I get to. Because God has been so good to me. God has been so good. And so my heart in prayer for us is that we live between the two warnings, the warning of Paul and the warning of James. See, we don't ever want to fall into the trap or fall into the mistake that we can be saved because of our good works. But we also don't want to fall into that misunderstanding that somehow just having a mental assent to certain theological truth is what will save us. Authentic faith results in a changed life. It will result in doing good. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. Uh, I also want to invite us to receive prayer. And so as we're standing, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to go into our final worship set. But as we do so, we always offer prayer to folks. And today I just want to encourage you to receive prayer. And there's different uh, things you might come up for. One might be just because there's a need in your life. It could be a physical need, a relational need, a spiritual need. And so you want to receive prayer for that. Another reason why you may come up is because you want a blessing on your life. And so we have intercessors. They have these glow sticks that they're wearing. And so if you just want a blessing on your life, and I don't know why anyone would not want a blessing on their life, uh, I would invite you to come up. Um, today, uh, especially uh, if you have a situation where you have a, a real deep concern for a child of yours, I want to invite you to come up. I don't know what the circumstance might be, but just sense that, that might, you may need a prayer for that. You're maybe a child that you're very concerned about, okay? So I'm going to um, just invite you to pray right now with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much. You're so good. Thank you for your grace and how you have made yourself known to us. And God, I pray that each one of us would respond to you with true, authentic faith, that we would be trusting in you and your shed blood on the cross that paid the price for our sin. And in response to that, I pray that we would yield ourselves to you. God, there are people here who have maybe in some ways they've just closed their heart to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would open their hearts, that you would do a great work of just showing them what authentic faith is and maybe convicting them that they, they up until this point, they've had a religion, but they haven't had authentic faith. Thank you, Lord. Pray your blessing on us now as we continue with musical worship. May the words and the songs express truly our hearts toward you. In Jesus' name, amen.